Back here with Sean. How are you, my friend? Excellent. Happy to be here. Good, good, good. Well, it is your home after yeah, all. Yeah, I'm here. Your home away from home. So we've done in this series microphones, like top five. And, and they, when Ryan asked me to do a top five, it's always going to up as 10 and probably needs to be 20. But we've done microphones. We have done EQs. Um, now we're going to do depending on which order you watch this in, mic preamps. I think I've got like seven or eight, so it's not going to fulfill the top five. But in no particular order, but because it's up first and because it's inexpensive, I've got very strong opinions about clones. Um, sometimes clones are more lookalikes than clones. Would you, would you agree with that? Very uh, much think? so. Very much so. However, Warm here aren't claiming this really is anything. They are just making an affordable mic pre. I was really pleasantly surprised about how good this sounds. It's very inexpensive. It's called the Tone Beast. And I think if you are moving away from just using your internal mic pre's on your Audient, Focusrite, RME, whatever it might be, yeah. Behringer, whatever your inexpensive interface might be, this could be the first kind of dip your toe into uh, Mike Priest. Now, as you were saying, this used to be bright orange, didn't it? Yeah, uh, I like the black look. I think yep. it's a little more subdued, uh, which is cool because, you know, if it looks good, it probably sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> to me, like, this is a piece where so many features that yep. you might have to spend a lot more money to get. Yep. Like, you know, front panel stuff is super handy, especially if you're in a studio without a patch base. So, you know, being able to plug in. All this stuff here that allows you to choose, you know, your high Z input, line level input, you know, phantom power pad, polarity, high pass filter. There's a lot of really great, really expensive preamps that don't have high great, pass filters yeah. and things like that. The tone control stuff, that seems to be like a really kind of cool it's really thing. It's smart, like, you know, because if you're going to use an external piece of analog hardware, you're doing it because it colors the sound. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. If it doesn't color the sound, then just don't buy it. Just use the one inside. I mean, like the Audion mic pre's like have zero sound. That's why I love them. They're really quite, kind of neutral um, in a really positive way. So, but if you wanted to soup it up a little bit, stick this in front of it. Yeah. And, and I think that that is like something that ties to like, you know, using vintage preamps, like driving a yep. 1073 or yep. something like that, being able to have vintage or clean, different output transformer choices, and then also an output pad, I'm assuming, so that you can Drive saturate it. it. And yep. then an output control on a yep. preamp of this price point is awesome. Like, It's pretty darn fantastic. It sounds really, really good. And like Sean says, it's a ton of features and it's very inexpensive. So I think this is one of their all-star kind of pieces of equipment. We did just try out something which I don't know if it's going to be released before or after this video, which is pretty special for the price. So I think they've done something else really super exciting. But this to me is a flagship product. I think it teaches people how preamps work and gives them an idea of why they would need something. And to be honest, it's kind of a really good color box. So if you want something inexpensive that you can mess with and add saturation to, and you've already got all of your expensive preamps, this is worth getting just for a color box to mess with existing sounds as well. Yeah, I'm sure the distortion you can create from that is, you know, Pretty that's unique. a whole thing. Like, you know, yeah. it's going to be different than, you know, a clone or something yeah. that is, you know, very well known. So I think it would be a really great, great piece in the toolbox. Yep, yeah, exactly. All right, so next up, might be a little bit of the other end of the spectrum. Kind of. Yeah, I, back in, I want to say 2000, I think, when Brent Averill, as it was originally called, Brent Averill Enterprises, yep. BAE. But now it's British Audio Engineering. It's still the same company. It is exactly the same company because the main techs that build this are exactly the same. I think it's three guys that hand make all the high-end stuff and they are the same guys that worked under Brent that are still there. So rest assured, same quality. I got a 1064 and a 1073. 1064 is slightly different EQ yeah. points. And most of the the records, like when I flew to Indiana to record with the Fray and also record with a ton of other stuff, I brought the 1073 out, the BAE right, one. Yeah. So all the vocals were cut through that. And that sound where you bring the output down and then just hit that so it just starts to clip. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's, it's, it's all wrong because Rupert's whole thing was he was trying to make the cleanest right, yeah. mic pre ever, and I'm abusing it. But that whole saturation that this thing does that nothing else does is, yeah. is 
is special. So Much to uh, Ryan's chagrin, I did choose the one with the EQ because he wanted to do a separate EQ thing and discussion with it. But that's another thing that makes this so special. You know, as we were talking about earlier in our other video, on, on, is that, you know, that's your kick drum. You can go there at 60 hertz and boost. You can go to the bass guitar, boost at 110. You can go to the bottom snare, boost at 220. You know, you know it's, it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle way of thinking. But before parametric or semi-parametric EQs, before you could get into in-between yeah. stuff, this is how some of the best records in the world were mixed. But in the, the thing about all those frequency points that, you know, Rupert picked back in the day, they're so musical. And all of them work yep. in a really amazing way. And if you're track, I had the luxury of having 24 vintage 1073s in my studio for many years. So Wonderful. very like familiar with that. And like when you can kind of fit all the pieces and kind of like get the boxiness of the drums out and the guitars and, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff, it feels very limited when you first look at it, but it is so musical. And yep. yeah, I mean, this is this would be my desert island, definitely. Yeah, and I find, to be honest, I've stuck with this kind of area. I'm usually cutting about 350 and 360 is the is the is the area here. So that's stuck with my brain when I'm trying to cut out honkiness out of drums and oh, toms. Yeah. I'm always got about 350, 360. Cut it. You know, I'm still looking at 60 hertz on a kick drum. I'm usually about 80 to 100, maybe 110 on the bass, maybe a little bit lower than this, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Wonderful, wonderful device. And that, like, the tonality of it too, like, even this is like a fixed frequency, but it's like so big of a swing. It's like broad strokes of like really musical top end, or like you can take the edge off of something. So yeah, it's, I don't know. This to me is like one of the, the best musical paintbrushes out there. Yep. And the mid range here, where you go to, what is it? One, six, one, eight, can't remember. And just boost that ever so slightly on an acoustic guitar. I'm serious. Boost that mid on the acoustic. Oh, yeah. Just pushes it forward just a little bit. Everybody makes that mistake, myself included, when you first start recording acoustic guitars as you crank the high end. You want to turn it into a sitar, do that. You just need to push a little bit of mids on that, just a tiny bit, and your acoustic guitar will just move forward. It's really gorgeous. And then, of course, this, not a lot of people know this, but that's my Michael Caine uh, part there for anybody who knows what I'm doing. On the back of a 1073, there was an impedance switch. It's on the back of every single one if you pull it out of the console. And that was there specifically for using microphones like ribbons that didn't have as much output. So you could flick the impedance and you can match it. It's a nice tool now for any microphone just to see how it interacts with the gain. It might make it sound better. Yeah, and that that's like a, I mean, I would call that more of a tone switch than anything because yeah. you can get a mic to react so much differently. So yeah. it's really nice that it's on the front because that is yep. a very pain, painful process to try and I think do. most people, I know a lot of people didn't even know it existed. Yeah, and if they're set, I mean, you know, there's an optimal way to have them set depending on what you're using, but I mean, it's a creative way to have different choices out of the box, so. So BAE, wonderful company, the 1073, Regardless, I think their, theirs is the closest to a vintage Neve, in my humble opinion. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. It's pretty, well, AMS Neve is doing a recreation of the classic series yeah. now that are built the, in the same fashion as the old ones. Yeah. But B has been consistently making these yeah. through the time that no one was making yeah. reissues. So. Uh, yeah, they 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 have the history of doing it and doing it for a long time. Doing it for a long time at the highest level. And remember, still made by exactly the same guys that were doing all of those rebuilds and the original ones from Brent Averill days. So, yeah, I, 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 those, those, those guys are worth their weight in gold. So our mutual good friend, Mr. Dave Garrett, I suppose we call him Mr. API. There are other API people, but he's a wonderful guy. And he told me that 312, 512, and 212 are essentially exactly the same pre's. What do you feel about that? Have you ever shot them out? I have not. But uh, I would have a hard time believing that. <laughs> but I could also see that. I mean, a lot of that is gain staging. And uh, the one that we're looking at here mm -hmm. does have the gain stage. And that was always a tricky thing I found. I had some 512s, yep, which too. were a little hot. And then yeah. some original 312s, which, you know, had a, a they were vintage ones. So they had like a yep. thing. Oh, I had a 20-channel console. Of right, them, so yeah, I, yeah. You're super familiar with that yeah, stuff. Very f the 212s, which would be something that you would see in like the legacies and stuff like yep. that. So I was not aware that they're all... But that checks It might out. be I mean, the, the majority of the architecture is the same. 
says a man who's using the word architecture to sound sophisticated. <laughs> it might be that a lot of it is the same and there's, there's subtle differences to drive them in different ways. Yep. I don't know. Dave, answers on the postcards. Let us know. Okay, so why am I talking about this? I think this is f- a phenomenal value for money piece because it's, it's not inexpensive, but you get four bleeding channels of API and I have so many wonderful experiences working with this. So when we did the second Frey record, we bought 007, yes, 007. We bought the seventh made API 1608. It was like early on, Hunter Crowley, I think, had like number one or two. You know, Hunter? Yeah, yeah. Round badge 62 for those yeah, uh, people. Yeah, famous uh, gear space Yes, user. yeah. And he's one of my oldest friends. Actually, a very talented guy. He was a drummer in the Warlocks and, and really knows his onions. Plus, he's a production sound guy. So right, yeah. He knows his gear. He knows his gear and a lovely fella. And he got a hold of us when I was talking about, like, we were going to finish up this Frey record in their studio. And I told him the gear, and he's like, dude, you've got to get a 1608. It's amazing. So we got a 1608, but, of course, there's only 16 channels of mic pre, and we're recording the band live and just doing fixes. So we needed to get at least 24, and in the end, we ended up getting, we ended up getting four of these for another 16 channels. Right. So we had 32 in. And I swear blind, eyes closed, you didn't know what mic pre you were on, whether you were on the 1608 on these. These sounded absolutely phenomenal. I can't speak more highly about this. Great sounding. I think it's a little bit fiddly, you know, because it's on a tiny little control. Stepped, but, stepped on the top, though, which is nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, I didn't have any problem. Well, but. so in my experience from the early, like the 3124 plus, mm-hmm only had mic preamp gain. Yeah, so the yeah. V has the volume, which is huge because yeah. now you can start using it like a color box. You can yeah. push it and turn it down. So yeah. that's a massive upgrade to this version, yeah. I think, yeah, which is I cool. Agree. Cannot say enough good things about that. Absolutely amazing way of getting getting four really high quality mic pre's. Wow. Classic sounding record making quality. They do make another version like this that has some routing, so you can use it as a summing mixer. So if you're into doing Ooh. things like... As well? Mi- yeah, so there's another version. Uh, I'm not sure of the model, but it does summing, so you can have multiple mics in a single output. So if you're doing guitar blending on like, you know, a couple different mics, I've seen John Mayer possibly use one in a live rig on some mm. stuff. But uh, to me, that's a really cool feature. If you're not in the console world and sure. you want to have some features like that, they have a version like that. And, you know, the ability, I, I find that it does, they are pretty hot. So yep. pad, you know, being able to do that. But yep. I think this sort of being able to blend those is, is the, the step up from the earlier versions yep. of this where you're limited on that a bit. Wonderful, Mike Pre. If you want to get some, high, you know, you've you've come in, you've already messed around. Maybe you start off with the with the tone beast or whatever. Now you want to step it up and get into a bunch of high quality mic pre's. I mean, like two of these, eight, probably do a decent drum kit. You know, close mics, couple of room mics. Yeah, hundred percent. I think yeah, that's a that's a win win combination. So. Yeah, absolutely superb. And like I said, personal experience. You know, number one record. <laughs> it was. And these were what were recorded on it. Really, really amazing Mike Priest. And not the only number one record that an no, API not. has been part Many of. Many hundreds so. and hundreds and hundreds of number one records yeah. have been recorded using these Mike Priest. Yeah. So this is quite Desert Island-ly. Is that a phrase? Sure. Anyway, this, the TG series, um, obviously is some of the most classic sounding mic pre's ever. We think of Beatles. I suppose at this point it would have been Abbey Road right at the very end. But of course, you know, the TG series is also Pink Floyd. I have personally never owned these. I always go to studios where they have them and then I plug in and use them. You, on the other hand, are an owner, so. Yeah, so at one point I had eight channels of TG pre, so I had three of these and two TG uh, channels and these are some of my f- most favorite preamps. Now, I use them mostly guitar-based stuff. Was like I just love that sound. There is a ton of massive pop vocals that have been recorded through this preamp. So, like people like Avril Lavigne and Adam Levine from Rune Five and stuff. There's, All of the veins. Yes, that's a super popular front end for pop vocals, like a C eight hundred G or Manly or something. I never this. knew that. So, also uh, love the. Output trim, so you can push the preamp, drive it into some saturation, sort of, you know, 1073-esque. The 300 ohm button, so we talked about on the BAE. This also has a pin selector on the front, so we can choose between 1200 and 300. 
and get some different tonalities out of the microphones, whether it's a dynamic or a ribbon that may react to an impedance change. The most recent versions of this, this is a switch on the back that used to be on the back yep. that now sums to one output. So you can also blend oh, two together wow. to have a single output. So Okay, so you can get it here and then just control you. Yeah, and so you can, and that, that turns it on so they both come out of one output out of the back. So. Okay, so that means I could double mic. So I could have this front mic guitar, flip the polarity on the back, boom, blend together, and now single I've got one output, guitar. Yeah. Nice. So, um, yeah, no, I don't know. This is, to me, this is one of my favorite pieces of gear that exists, and, and Wade has consistently done amazing stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we love Wade. He's, uh, he, 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 he's the man. We had a blaster in Iowa out there, and I, I love the fact that I think he's like the local employer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shell Rock, Iowa is an uh, interesting little. Yeah, Shell Rock, Iowa is about eight houses, and I think there's about 20 people working there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, very he cool. is, he's Shell Rock's yeah. sole employer. So, do, doing great work. They're doing, I mean, there's always some cool stuff. They just did a new compressor, the 660 and stuff. And so, this is probably one of his longest running products and still probably one of the most popular. So, uh, it's yeah. great to know this. it's good for pop vocals. I never thought, but then if I think about, you know, Floyd stuff of the early 70s, some of the best sounding vocals ever recorded. So, yeah, I mean, it'll make a sense. It, uh, yeah, it is an amazing piece of gear. I, yeah, love it. Yes. So you'll notice there is an empty space here. That's because we're going to talk about the mic pre's that are in the console. We just did a, a masterclass here over a few days and we tracked everything through the pre's in the console and they sound phenomenal now i love rupert need designs but you have a pretty darn good knowledge of it give us a, a little bit of a synopsis yeah on the so uh this would be rupert neve's last preamp design in production before he passed away a few years ago and so the shelford line of preamps there is the 5052 the 5051 eq compressor and then the shelford channel so different ways you can get a hold of this sound but uh lineage to the 1073 the mic preamp i would say is probably a little bit more transparent than how heavy-handed a 1073 is uh, but the design in the circuit has the silk feature, so uh, red and blue silk are available to drive harmonic saturation, whether it's red in the, the higher frequencies and blue in the lower frequencies. So. I tend to go on the blue and then just turn it full up. <laughs> As you can see, all of them are all the way up. So we either like it on or like it off, and yeah. so that's sort of a, a, to me, it's a tonal shaping thing where it's like the blue works on some things, the red works on some, some things, yeah. and some things it doesn't need it. So yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a kind of on-off, flavor thing and it's it's nice to have that flexibility uh, because they all sound so cohesive tracking through the console really kind of delivers cool results like that but this on a standalone situation has the same kind of flexibility as the 1073 so we have a variable high pass filter which is nice that it's not notched so we can kind of fine tune that a little bit more and then the frequency points are very very close to a 1073 so you know we're looking at 35 60 100 220 uh you know 200 350 700 1.5 five, three, and six, uh, and then either eight or 16K on the top end. So See, that makes sense, because I was talking about the 1073, how I, I actually boost closer to 100 on the bass, and that's probably prevalent for most of us, so they moved it to 100. Yeah, and so that that really kind of gives you those super musical EQ points, uh, some flexibility in the you know peak or lift uh, on the high and low shelves, and then a tight Q for the mid band. But to me, uh, you know, broad stroke Musical EQ, this is, you know, the best possible option of, of something that is, you know, has new features but has the classic sound. So excellent. So I one of my favorite things with going to trade shows over the years was always going to the DW Fern booth. He's just such a great guy and always loved the equipment he made. And it's wonderful to see this here. So it's definitely not on the cheaper side of all the mic pre's. It's definitely right up there, but an absolutely superb piece. What do you, uh, what do you find you love it on? Uh, everything we plug into it sounds great. So there you go. Done. Finished. Um, it is, I would describe it as an elegant piece of equipment. Um, it feels good. It sounds good. Uh, we, we've been using it on piano recordings, uh, sometimes overheads in there, vocals. Um, it, 
it, it really kind of is a larger than life thing. Um, it takes ribbon mics as lots of gain. So based, I think, uh, Doug, he didn't really copy anyone's design, but based on an RCA tube preamp from probably the fifties, forties or fifties. And, uh, Everything that these guys make is of the highest quality. And so this to me is like... So you need 32 channels of it. Waiting for the console to show up. Uh, yeah, we would love that. But it's, you know, it's one of those things if if we're doing, you know, any classical recording, uh, if I'm not using something super clean like Grace, if I can get yeah. some character into it, this thing does it. And just things that, you know, uh, an acoustic guitar and a vocal, and just like yeah. trying not to... Try not to wreck... A performance and capture it as as wow. as perfectly as possible. This thing is is special. So amazing. Not a lot of controls. It's got great, great, great paint job. Really nice view meters and uh, sounds amazing. So absolutely amazing. And Doug is a wonderful, wonderful guy. Yeah, uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, he's yeah. It's uh, if you get a chance, he's got a podcast and some some info out there. If you want to get really nerdy, uh, right. he's into it. And the guys, uh, the Hazelrig brothers, who uh, are are running his company these days, uh, amazing musicians, and we, we work closely with them and, and their products and stuff too here. So That's great. Um, yeah, it's it's an awesome piece of gear. It's definitely not for uh, the faint-hearted when, when you have to throw down for these... These units, but beautiful sound, uh, nothing like it. So, yeah, I've always I've always loved his stuff, um, and I remember the first time I met him and I asked him all about it, and of course I got to try one. It, I love the fact that he was that classic idea of an engineer that wanted to make something for himself, which is, you know, Trident consoles. The A range was the in house engineers. Yeah, you know, all of when when all my friends that worked for the BBC, they would just tell those stories of like the BBC engineers. Asking Neve, asking Audient, asking all these different companies, Calrec, to make the gear that they wanted to their spec. And didn't always happen. Didn't always happen. So the fact that Doug did it is absolutely incredible. Yeah. It's been wonderful. Thanks everybody for watching. Thank you for helping me out on this. My I pleasure. really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, there will be links to everything down below. And of course, let us know what are your favorite mic pre's as well. So long, farewell, Alvida Zayn, au revoir. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.